I'm writing a book, and I finally decided on the name Wheeling Through the Years. And that's going to be describing what I had to do for my 65 years of survival. The book I'm writing, which is part of the documentary, will just tell people about my life as a 65 year old and what it's been like living with a disability that I can't hide. I can't run away from I can't pretend it's not there. And it's not going to be a, a sappy book. It's going to be honest, frank, the major of how attitude is changing, slowly but truly. You saw it at the counter when I went out there. Nobody freaked out. They did what they had to, looking back over my 29 years ago. I've really grown. And I think it's because the people here have, have accepted me as chief. Not the guy in the wheelchair, but I have a name. I have a reason why I'm here. And they recognize that. Independent living means I'm the boss of my own household. Even if I need help, I can direct people to do what I cannot do. I'm an advocate for people with disabilities. I advocate almost on every level, local, state, and national, on issues that concern people having disabilities, trying to keep people in the forefront and make people realize we're people first, disabled, second, third, fourth, whatever. You always look at a person as a person first. Initially, before I'd even met you, it was just a job, and yeah. you know, I knew that it'd be a little different because I'm not used to working with someone with a disability that close quarters. Yeah. But after getting to know you, I think I think my view changed drastically. <laughs> you definitely uh, there's more than meets the eye with Keith Ruff, that's for sure. So. I never would have imagined, never would have imagined 10 years ago that I would still be here, still be around. You know, I mean, at the beginning it was, it was a job, it was a yeah. way to make some money when I was a poor college student, and it definitely turned into a friendship that I never saw coming. Knowing you has made me really glad to be part of a generation that really can recognize some of the things that some of the ways that I think we've failed before. And I just hope, you know, one of my hopes in working with you is that in the future I can be someone, because of this experience, who, you know, advocates for people who otherwise, you know, didn't get all the same um, things that they really deserve just as far as being a person and being an individual. And, um, yeah, it just makes me really glad to, to be here in a time when things not even just in nursing, but socially and, yeah. and politically are kind of churning and changing. And when I think of um, the future of the disability movement, I always think first these days of Olmstead, yeah. the Supreme Court decision that said, uh, based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, that people have a right to live in the community. Um, and 
Um, that, of course, is that's, that's become the heart and soul of what we try to do at the Center for Disabilities and Development, as you know. Um, but I think given all of the challenges that are facing the country these days and, and, and facing the state of Iowa as far as the budget, yes. um, we need to be reminded that there's civil rights at stake here. And, and I think um, that future progress over the next few years, especially until the budget gets better, um, I think Olmstead and, and the implementation of Olmstead, which basically means making a life in the community possible for everyone, yeah. I think that's going to be the, the focal point. We're going to try to do 10 in a row to the front, to the lamp, and to the side again. It's not that we ignore the left side, but the right side is the primary source of independence. Without my right arm, again, like I said before, I could not live or found it on my own. And we want to maintain strength and range of motion through his shoulder because Keith still dresses himself and Keith is very independent. And I need to stay that way. Yeah. All right, to the Leo. I mean, you really just have to plan ahead. That's the thing. And at first, you don't think to ask those kind of questions. Like, are there stairs you have to get up or get down? Um, you know, is there a ramp? If so, how wide is it? And even something as simple as using the restroom, if it's not wheelchair accessible, then, you know, that can ruin an entire <laughs> event and prevent them from being able to even go depending on the length of it. And it's something that you don't notice until you yourself are put in that position or know somebody who's in that position. And it's definitely been brought to my attention. It tends to be that at restaurants, people are more receptive to what he has to say, yeah. or at least will ask him and address him yeah. and try to talk to him first. And then if they have trouble understanding, you know, sometimes they'll turn, you know, to me like, oh, what did he, what did he say? And I was like, yes, he did say he wants a straw with his beer. <laughs> and a lot of people mistake birth defect as disease. They're not diseases. They're mainly brain damage. This was all brain damage at birth. I think I was told I had no oxygen for 18 seconds. And look what it did. But it hasn't prevented me from being part of the community. And it takes people like Megan and other people who work with me to keep me going. The fact that this is being filmed here on the Ped Mall, yeah. um, we, for a series of um, like noon meetings for yeah. several weeks. Yeah. It was right around the corner right. there. Yeah. Um, we met and we, you taught me about what personal assistance services were, the role that they play in promoting independence and community integration for people with disabilities. And um, we worked together on a grant that was eventually submitted to the Governor's Developmental yes. Disabilities Council and was funded. I went to school from 82 to 86. Then I went to work in various job settings. I worked for Systems Unlimited for three years. Until I came to my present job, which I've worked for 21 years this coming November. And what I do there, 
what we do is we don't help people. We assist people to help themselves. Because if you keep helping somebody, they come learn to rely on that. And that's the number one problem with disability or any minority. If you keep helping them, they expect it. And then they don't have any motivation to go out in the real world and find what they need or want. We don't treat people like patients because most disabilities are not progressive. What you see is what you get. You don't like it tough. I can't change. And that's one thing, thank God, I always remind myself. I can't change what had to happen. It wasn't my fault, so why the hell worry about it? This is the 20th anniversary yes. of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA has opened up literally doors and businesses and, yeah. and um, I think there's there's much more awareness when, when kids going to school in regular schools and yeah. there's a whole new generation of young people who grow up with the expectation that people with disabilities are a key component of the community. Up. Down. Or down. Down. There you go. Keith does stand at the sink to do dishes. When we're not here? Yes. I do dishes every night. And on the weekend I do twice a day. Okay, give me one more good one. Okay. I've been working with Keith since I started physical therapy school in 2008. And um, basically my role with Keith is to maintain his function, his range of motion, so that uh, he can do his activities of daily living, like get dressed in the morning, get in and out of bed. Um, so this entails strengthening with his lower extremity, walking um, for endurance and heart health. Uh, we do strengthening in his arms, so his wrist, because where he works, he does a lot of writing. Um, he has to maintain range of motion in the wrist for his wheelchair. That's how he gets around. Um, we do shoulder range of motion and strengthening because of, like I said earlier, he dresses himself. Um, he feeds himself. So basically my role is just maintain that function. I read a book a month. So, and the paper. A paper a day. The reason I read papers is not to be noticed, but to know what's going on on the legislative level, both in Washington and in Des Moines, because what goes on there affects what we do in the office. Now, the authors I work for, we have an umbrella called the federal government. So we're one of 390 offices in the country. And we all do practically the same thing, except there's a few regional needs, like Iowa needs more transportation in the rural areas. California needs more money for educating people. So there's a very subtle difference in the regions 
the any orphans then. But our main purpose is to help. Now, I'd like to assist other disabled people to be as independent as they want. I enjoy life like I tell people. I travel. I've been to a lot of different countries. I go to Washington a lot. I've noticed him take an interest in more things just as we get out and do more. I never thought that he would, you know, want to come see a soccer game or that he'd ever done any of those things. And I just learned that he uh, slowly was more and more interested in there. There is a lot that. Uh, or a rugby game. Yeah, or a rugby game. He went to a rugby match as well, which was fun. I grew up in a very broken family. So I left home at a very early age. A lot of people that we work with are still under mom and dad's roof, even though mom, mom and dad think that's the greatest thing in the world. It's not, because nine out of 10 of those kids their parents will be dead before they die. And what the hell are they going to do if mom and dad protect them all their life? I was lucky. I left home when I was 22 and never went back. Well, I was down with living in a rooming house near my first job and how to handle people that were not derelicts but alcoholics and trying to keep them off my territory. That was quite a thing because I didn't always have a wheelchair. I was on crutches until I broke my leg. Now I have a pin in my leg. And I think the toughest thing over was getting out of this very difficult job. I was selling household products over the phone. And you know what changed my life? Breaking my leg. Because when my rehab was finished, Volk Rehab came to the center and said, would you rather go to college? And I said, you damn well, that I do. <laughs> so I started college at a late age of 32, but it was worth it. What we're to do is basically work in partnership with others to promote the integration, um, full community participation and productivity of people with disabilities. And we do that through pre-service training programs, um, in other words, teaching young people preparing for any kind of career about the role they can play in supporting people with disabilities. Um, we do community education programs. We do research, as you'd expect from a university-based program. We do um, information dissemination. Of CDD also has a wide range of clinical services, but one of the most significant things we're doing these days is working on what we call systems change or systems improvement, um, which re basically is all about helping uh, the state and community service systems support community integration or implement Olmstead, basically. The 20 years in Iowa City have been very exciting, very helpful to me, even though I was 38 when I got here. It helped me find the real keys. I never was so accepted 
as I am in this town. And that kind of motivated me to be what I am today. People my age were not. When I was born, I was still in the closet, per se. Because people, we were seen but not heard. Don't forget I was born in 45. So we've come a long way. That's another reason I'm writing the book, is to show the difference between how disabled were accepted years ago compared to now. Now we're getting someplace. Not, not fast enough, but we're getting there. And I tell my fellow person with disability, don't depend on the law all the time. Do it yourself. Because if you do it yourself, you'll have a better feeling about you. You've accomplished something. It wasn't given to you. I went to grade school, and there wasn't one non-disabled kid. They were all disabled. Do you know the biggest shock of my life? Going to a school and being in the majority, graduating, and going into the real world and turning into a minority overnight. That was the biggest damn shock that I had overcome. And there's no need to do that. People need to be exposed to whatever is out there. And just like that little kid, that kid begged his mother to let me give him a ride. See? And that thing. And he's only five years old. And when he got in my lap, all he would say is go, go faster, go faster. I think what it is, and I'm not blaming America, period. We're looking always for the perfect body, the perfect image. But what about other people that can't have a perfect image? Are they worth anything less? Then somebody with a good-looking image, I don't think so.